both in the Thatcher years and in these last 13 years of conservative governments, the funding for schools goes down, the applications to private schools goes up. Now, they, they will say, well, that's, that's choice and that's a sign of success, but actually it's a sign of a national failure. The more applications there are to private schools, the more that shows that education policy is failing. When children are removed from their parents and taken into the care system to be raised by people who don't love them, we all agree that's a pretty bad outcome. It might have been sadly necessary, but no one would think that putting a kid in a group home is plan A. But if a boy is separated from his family for most of the year, to be raised in an institution notorious for horrendous acts of child abuse and bullying, but it goes by the name of Eton or Winchester and costs £45,000 a year, well, who wouldn't want the very best for their children? British public schools, which weirdly is the name we give to our most expensive and prestigious private schools, are pretty unique in the Western world for the stranglehold they have over the uppermost echelons of our society. The 7% of pupils who are privately educated can expect to make up around 70% of senior judges, over half of top journalists, and to date, about 85% of our prime ministers. What kind of governance do we get from this tribe of men, separated from their mothers as children, and taught from the first day of prep that they were born to rule? With me to answer this question is Richard Beard, former pupil of Pinewood School and Radley College, and the author of Sad Little Men, How Public Schools failed Britain. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, could you just talk me through your personal history of boarding schools? So where and when and how old? Uh, well, my I think my personal boarding history, my, my, my personal history of boarding schools didn't really have any relevance to anybody until I realised that I started at boarding school in the same year as David Cameron and Boris Johnson, not in the same schools, but in the same year. So therefore, I would have seen much of what they saw and in my memory, the kind of things I saw become increasingly outrageous with time, really. Um, and then I thought, well, that's quite interesting because these people who are now in charge of us. Well, they, they start at the same time as me. So in 1975, aged eight, um, I went to boarding school, to a prep school, and then I moved on to public school in 1980. So recognising yourself as part of this weird brotherhood of conservative leaders who had taken hold of the reins of power in this country. When did that happen for you? When did you go, we have this experience in common? Well, I think part of, part of the kind of tribal um, exceptionalism of this particular group of people, um, and I don't think it's just boarding schools, I think it spreads down through, through all private schools because the boarding schools, there's only four all boys boarding schools now. Mine was an all boys boarding school. There's only four left. So there's Eton, Harrow, Winchester and Radley College, which is the one that I was at. Uh, but other private schools look up to them really as the top of the pinnacle. This is what you're trying to achieve, the same kind of success that Eton has achieved. You know, every private school would like to have a prime minister. It'd be great for the prospectus um, later on. But I think part of it is, part, part of the way it works is not really realizing you're, you're a tribe. It's become so uh, exclusive and so has, the blind spots are so extensive um, if he feels like a kind of uh, a, a normal and a, and a normalized existence. So um, you can then go on through life into adult life and accept the privileges, accept the prizes without any real understanding or awareness that privilege has brought you to this position in the first place. So when do you realize? I think you, know, you can realize, people realize in all sorts of ways, everyone has their own sort of personal story of revelation. Um, but it is possible to stay in the safe places, if you like, the safe public school places all your life. Famously, David Cameron uh, hadn't lived outside the M40, M4 corridor before he became prime minister. Um, and that's quite a good example of, you know, where is he going to get this revelation from um, exactly? Uh, and you look at some of the leaders now and you look at Johnson, or you look at some of his cabinet that he... Um, that, that he appointed, and you think, well, where, where were they going to learn that actually they have this very rarefied, um, this rarefied education, which gives them certain attitudes, which they've never questioned. Um, but people do question them. Often, you know, the, the, the idea of a lot of people is, you know, travel is going to bring them some kind of revelation. That's the classic one. Uh, sport is very useful because it takes people out into communities if they carry on playing. Quite often public school 
uh, sports people don't carry on because they find out it's you know it's not what they used to with the superb pitches and the facilities and the balls already and pumped up for them by somebody they never see. Um, but if people do carry on doing anything out in the community, it might be work, might be volunteering, then they might start to recognise that actually they have had this privileged and exclusive education. What it's like when you're an outsider to it. So when you're someone like me and you went to a comprehensive and then you go to a university like UCL, you start meeting people who went to these schools. And there is a kind of fascination with it because I had read so much about boarding schools because they're suffused through our popular culture. It's in Harry Potter, it's in Mallory Towers, there's all of this romance. And also I understood the relationship they had to class inequality. And so I'd meet someone who went to Eton or to Winchester or to Radley or wherever it is. And I'd be like, tell me everything. What was it like? And they'd say, it was like nothing really. And it was so frustrating and evasive. I could never get an answer before I read this, to be honest with you, about what it was like on the inside. And is that a deliberate tactic, the evasion? Oh, yeah, deflection is very much you know, a, a, a learned public school trait. Uh, and a private school trade, I think, because although you can be unaware of the privilege in the sense of not fully appreciating how far it can can move you on in life, you're not unaware that it can sometimes create um, animosity and you need to defend yourself from that. Um, but then the, ki- the kind of things you learn in a boarding school in particular about self-defense, you know, deflection will be part of that. And of course, that then gets very closely connected, you know, perhaps with politeness, another ty- type of deflection of, of never having to say what you actually mean or what you actually feel. And then you go from politeness to charm, which is a way of you know, getting what you want from other people. Um, and then self-deprecation, is another thing. But then if you don't really, if you haven't shown your true self, it's very easy to self-deprecate because you're not self-deprecating anything sincere. Um, and you can end up on the outside looking like Hugh Grant. And that's just fine because, you know, nobody can touch Hugh Grant. Um, and I'm sure that's kind of a bit like the experience you had in UCL. So when when you're eight years old and you're watching your parents drive away and you're not going to see them for most of the year, how does a child process that? Well, I think you know, inevitably you process it in the way that adults tell you you should process it, um, which is storing up problems for later. But if the adults around you are telling you these are going to be the best days of your life, this is the best thing for you, or or perhaps um, in another you know, damaging way, say, well, we've made a lot of sacrifices to to bring you here. You know, you should enjoy this. You f- you feel that um, you really have to react to it in that adult way, which doesn't seem to correspond to what it actually feels like, which is you want to go into a corner and cry and you want your 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 parents to come back and fetch you. Um, so very early on, there's this sense of a dislocation between what you're being told by, by responsible adults and what you're actually feeling. The response to that is to repress the feelings. Um, but it also makes anyone who goes through that process very suspicious. Um, of anybody's motives in the future, especially when people are telling you something is is good for you. Yeah, because they're like, you told me it was good for me, and then I didn't see you for a year. Yeah, exactly. Well, it was never quite that that long, but certainly in when I started in 1975, you could have a good three, four, five weeks without seeing your parents, and they might come for a rugby match or something. But uh, you could have like long periods of time without seeing them. And what happens if that eight year old or nine year old expresses the emotion of? missing their parents and they cry or they struggle to adjust you know when you're when when you're eight nine years old it's almost impossible to suppress those emotions so um people going through this experience will 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 recognize the uh the memory of being in a dormitory and crying or wanting to cry It's, it's a bit like seeing anything which is truly kind of visceral it's a bit like vomiting and you see someone vomit you want to vomit but if you hear someone crying you already want to cry then you start crying and then this kind of volley of cries goes around the goes around the room and you you can hear that and yet the next day nobody will admit to having cried so straight away there's this this idea that you could ignore other people's emotional pain essentially um and then once you learn to do that you can learn empathy Clearly, it's not very useful. You know, what's the use of empathy when the next day we've got to get up and we've got to pretend that never happened? 
you know, you want to get on because again, you're going into the school where what's important is getting good marks and going up the class and eventually going on to another school and then a good university. This is the ethos which is there is to excel. And you can see that in in the way that private schools will endlessly trumpet their A and B grades at, at A levels. You know, that this is in the end the thing that they want to present to the world. Um and right at the beginning of that process, if you're a boarding school, is, well, don't show empathy for other people's emotions. And then don't show empathy for your own. Don't show empathy for your own sadness. And then perhaps it's not surprising that later in life you can be in positions of power, which this education has given you, whether it's in business or in politics um, or even in the law, and then not have empathy for other people's situations. You know, especially if you don't understand them. If they're outside your tribe and you don't have empathy, then you've got a double reason not to really feel for other people. I mean, you've got some professions where it's like 70% of senior judges went to private school. I think it's 54% of top newspaper columnists. It's um, over 85% of prime ministers to this day. So you've got these people who wield extraordinary power over those who are less rich than them. And yet they've had their ability to empathise curtailed from such a young age. Yeah, and this, the Sun Trust brings out figures regularly and they don't really seem to be improving um you know and that aspect of not being able to empathize with people outside the social class i mean that is tribal but again i think that spreads from boarding schools down into private schools because if you go to a school where everyone around you really meaning your parents um and your possibly your peers certainly your teachers is telling you this is the best education available you know then by implication everyone else is getting a less good education and it's not a very big step to get to the point then say, well, everyone else is less well-educated and therefore everyone else is less worthy um, and therefore I deserve everything I get. Um, and you just get into this this cycle of, of entitlement. I remember the first time I ever did anything with the BBC. No, it was my first news night, actually. So you get taken down into the green room and there's all these like, politicians and their spads and you're just sort of there and you're a bit sweaty because you've cycled there. Um, somebody asked me, what school did I go to? And I didn't know what that question meant. So I responded, oh, it's Enfield County. And it was a, a comprehensive school in North London. And it was really interesting for these reasons. And you watch them glaze over because it wasn't the name of a real school in their eyes. I had outed myself as somebody who wasn't part of the clique, who hadn't moved through that world. And so what I thought was biographical interest was actually a kind of filtering mechanism and it just filtered me out in this almost imperceptible way i mean is that something which resonates with you in terms of how <laughs> um the process of class recognition works yeah i i think there's there there is something kind of more more primeval going on there as well is that question also means you know who might what friends might we have in common i mean in there it happens to be in a context of the kind of TV show where you'd expect people have gone to the same kind of schools because they have for for for, for generation after generation since the BBC came into to existence. And then once you find people in common, you you can then believe that the other person is operating by the same rules as you, and that's very reassuring. Um, and if you don't have these people in common, which can start with schools or backgrounds, then you start thinking, well, do I know how this person is working? Do I know what their brain is doing? And it can be very um, uh, disturbing first to know that we've got us and them and that's them and secondly I don't know what them really wants from me I mean George Orwell is very good on revenge. this revenge possibly and then exactly fear then comes into it and George Orwell is really good on, on the the, the uh, attitude of privately educated to the rest of the country where for most of the time it's kind of patronising jollity but should the working classes in his view in the 30s and 40s um, and he's reporting on his own class. He says, should the working class get above themselves, then you need to clamp down on that with the utmost ferocity. Enough rats can take down a giant, that kind of thing. Yeah, and Orwell goes to see it all for himself. And he is appalled by his, um, on, in the road to Wigan Pier, he's appalled by his own, what he discovers are his own kind of inbred attitudes. Uh, and when I read that book as part of the research for writing Sad Little Men, I realized, well, that was what was bred into me. Nothing has really changed. We're in a single period which stretches from, I think, about the 1930s to probably the early 90s. And then there is an argument that things have slightly changed, which I don't entirely agree with. I mean, you talk about boarding schools being a total institution in this book. Could you maybe explain a bit what that means? 
Well, the total institution um, is is a phrase which was coined by Irvin Goffman, who's a Canadian-born sociologist, and he made a study of um, this in the 1950s of, of mental asylums of uh, uh, ships, um, of country houses, uh, and he put boarding schools in this um, in this category as well. And a total institution is any institution in which power can be exercised 24 hours a day on the people within it. Uh, and then he studied the power hierarchies between those who had the power and those who didn't have the power and how a certain type of peace was created in a total institution. And there's no doubt that a boarding school where you are for 24 hours a day in a very clear power hierarchy is a total institution in the style that Irvin Goffman talked about. What was really striking for me about reading the book was how much bodily humiliation of children featured in the day-to-day of boarding schools during the period that you describe. So swimming naked, having to wear rugby shorts without pants underneath, and something called the lavatory parade. Before I ask anything else, what was the lavatory parade? The lavatory parade was a morning ritual where after breakfast, all the boys had to line up um, to the communal laboratories and go in one after another and sit down in a cubicle with a door which didn't have a lock on it um stay for as long as necessary and then come out make another queue on the way out and there was a teacher sitting on a chair with a clipboard with everyone's name on it a box against everyone's name and the boys had to say tick or cross uh and ostensibly the reason for this was to check bowel movements and that all the boys were healthy but because no one really explained to us what it was, we used to just make nice patterns. So over the term, you'd have a tick, cross, cross, tick, cross, cross, or you'd find some other rhythm which which suited you. Um, so it was, in fact, a power play. It was just saying, you're going to have to do this, as one of, and we're in control of your body to the, to the, to the most intimate degree. Um, but I always think of the poor teacher. You know, one every day, one of the teachers had to go and sit on his chair with a clipboard um, outside these toilets and then listen to these boys come out and lie to him. And that was, you know, that was his professional life. I got a first in classics for this. Very possibly. If these were things which went on within the context of a prison or a CIA run black site, you would know what it was for. It would be to break down the psychological resilience of the inmates. So why is it happening to the children of the elite? Well, why would the answer that be any different? You're doing exactly exactly the same process. Um, you're trying to create this this compliant mass of people again you were saying about the, the what was your phrase you had the giants and the enough rats can take down a yeah, giant. the rats and the giants well you've got the same thing i mean a lot of the the development of private schools is about trying to control these boys especially in the 19th century where actually the boys were in some ways free i mean rugby is great because you've got lots of people involved it makes them run off their energy and at the beginning there were no limits to how many people could be involved so therefore you know rugby is embraced for this very reason and trying to control these numbers is is part of what you need to do in a total institution um and it's an exercise of power it's an exercise of power it's reminding you who is in charge um and these humiliations were part of, I mean, those wouldn't have been seen as humiliations. Those would have been seen there was as education and hygiene, those things that you mentioned. But there were humiliations as well. There were beatings, famously. And that's why it may have changed after 1989 when the Children Act actually said that children in boarding schools had to come under the um, the Convention of Human Rights, which they hadn't previously. So in fact, there was no real legal um, reason for private schools to change what they had always done in tough for time immemorial. And of course the parents knew because it tends to go generationally. So the same thing would have happened to parents who then sent their kids to these schools and then sent their kids to these schools. And they'd kind of expect that because they've then been socialized into saying, well, this made me what I am. And in the end, I want my kids to be what I am. Not necessarily because they're happy, but because they feel, they feel well, I'm defended even if I'm not happy. One of the things which I find really strange about when you encounter posh people who've been through the boarding school process and they're also sending their kids to them is that these ritualized humiliations become a joke to them so i was talking to somebody who's like a very you know old and venerable bbc person and he was telling me a story of how he and his wife were looking around a boarding school for their sons and the teacher said to them oh well the fathers all want to know about the cricket and the mothers want to know all about the buggery and he laughed and i laughed along because i wanted to be seen as someone who was just as worldly and experienced and then i got on 
the tube home and I was like that was disgusting and that was horrible you have turned what is an open secret about the presence of sexual abuse in these institutions into a big joke and a lark like, can can you help me understand that mindset a little bit yes I think that's <laughs> that's that sounds very unusual I think there's two th- there are two things to separate here is that the the closed nature of boarding schools and also um well, especially boarding schools, but it is true in private schools as well because there was less, you didn't have to have qualified teachers, for example. I don't think you, I think that's still true, actually. Yeah, still true. Um, uh, so the closed nature of boarding schools does allow for sexual abuse historically and has done. Um, I'm not approaching this from that perspective because I think sometimes what's that, 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 what that does is it distracts from the fact that actually damage is done psychologically to these children, even if they're very successful, even if they they're good in class and they end up going to Oxford University and, you know, playing rugby for Harlequins and, and whatever they may be doing or becoming a senior judge. There's damage which is done and it doesn't have to be connected to sexual abuse. Um, and so in, in, in the book, I'm quite keen to sort of separate mm-hmm. those things. Having said that, you know, the mindset which then allows it to be accepted, I mean, I, I can't really answer that. Um, you know, at the time when... Um, when I was at school, it was certainly not uncommon. We had you know, a music teacher who mysteriously disappeared um, and was sent to another school. But the work that's been done by people like Alex Renton uh, shows that actually these teachers were sent off with a reference to other schools. So it was, you kind of they were being passed around schools. It's a bit that, like within the Catholic Church of priests being yeah, moved around. Um, and and you know for that now to have become a kind of joke. I think in that instance, what's happening is the parents, by laughing at that, are trying to show that they're really tough too. They, 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 they want their kids to be toughened up. That's always been traditionally one of the things that happens um, in a private school is that the, the kind of deprivation, the physical you know, deprivation, um, certainly at that time in the sort of 70s and 80s, makes you tougher. And I think the, the parents are trying to show we're tough and we're worldly and in fact, therefore, by extension, that's what we want our kids to be. We want our kids to be, you know, not, well, you can almost say we don't want our kids to be snowflakes and not like buggery to be to be referenced in public like that because we can take it and that's what we're expecting mm. from you. I think there's a lot of messaging in that, actually. Um, and probably a lot of messaging in the fact that you were so shocked by it that you went along with it at the time and then only realised afterwards because then nobody is saying to these people in their enclosed spaces, don't do that. You know, you can't do this because this, therefore it just continues. It becomes a self-perpetuating system. So, I mean, my my mum is retired now, but um, for 25 years she was a social worker working in child protection. And she talks a lot about the sense of responsibility she felt when taking children into care. Because for her it had to be this absolute last resort because she was saying it's immensely damaging to the child's mentally damaging to the parents. And so it has to be unequivocally the lesser of two evils because you're doing this phenomenal act of violence, even if it's necessary. And when I was talking to her about doing this interview and reading this book, the thing that she was saying again and again is, I don't understand how a parent would elect to do that to undertake that kind of separation, to put your child in a context where they're being raised by people who don't love them. Um, From the perspective of parents who send their children to boarding school, what's the, not just the rationale, but their experience of that process? Do they feel in their heart of hearts that they're doing the right thing? Well, I think they have to. And and, and that that's sort of part of the complication that needs needs to be unpicked. I mean, there are studies which show that the psychological outcomes of going to boarding school are very similar to psychological outcomes of being in care. Um, obviously, you can then say, yeah, but you also have these compensating privileges and probably you have wealth as well behind you. So, you know, that does need to be taken into account as well. There are ways in which you can ameliorate this later by, for example, buying therapy. I mean, it's a very obvious way in which if you recognize that, you can change it quite, you know, you can actually actively try to change that um, so I don't want to equate those two things but psychologically those outcomes are recognized as being very similar I think the parents are motivated by fear um, primarily that there is this sense that 
you know, when you have kids, the world can feel really big and scary. Um, and if you've had a certain type of education, when it gets to the time when you have to send your kids to school, you, you go towards what you know because you survived it and therefore it must be okay because you did survive it. Um, and therefore, if it's also offering ways in which your kids can get on better in the world, that seems to be the best thing to do. And you hear that a lot. You hear that a lot. They say, I just couldn't. I mean, to stay with the state secondary school in my area. It's just terrible. Everyone knows it's terrible. There's a lot going on there as well, which is much more than, you know, I looked at their results in chemistry and they were two grades lower than the ones in the private school. Um, there's a lot to do with fear of wider society, of kind of tribal belonging thing. And I want to be with them, us, and I don't want to be with them. It's very divisive. Um, and I don't think it, even people involved in it will say it's not divisive because the whole point is it's divisive. It's going to divide your beautiful child from all the dirty children over there who might be mean to them and violent to them. And then, of course, short step to saying, well, all those children are dirty and violent. Mm. And so we'll just stay divided for the rest of our lives. Um and I think that 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 sense of self protection, which comes from fear, becomes the motivation. So you can say to yourself, "We're doing the best," but that word "best" doesn't in any way go towards what all the motivations are for sending your kid into a segregated part of our society, which is what it is. Are parents honest with themselves about that level of segregation? Because how how it feels to me is that I look at people who pay for private schools. And it means they have this disproportionate chance of getting a place at Oxbridge or having mm. one of these top roles in a top profession. And I kind of feel like something's been stolen from me and kids like me and kids who went to the same school as me. I'm like, you've stolen a bigger bite of the apple. And on some level, do the parents know that, that they've taken something mm. from other children who may be as deserving, if not more? Well, I, I don't think they do because I don't think that's how it's ever um, expressed, that when you pay for your own advantage and for, for to, to jump the queue, if you like, uh, you don't think that you're actually paying for someone else to be disadvantaged, but that's what you're doing just when you do the maths of you know who gets ahead and, and who doesn't. It's not a, not a level playing field from that point of view. So I, I don't think that it's ever thought about in those terms. But then again, if you actually think, by the time you get to the stage of taking on your job as a judge or the prime minister, well, I deserve this, or um, chairman of the BBC, not only do you think I deserve this, but you think that actually the people I know who've been through the same system, they all deserve this too. They're, they're the right kind of people. And of course, they're the best people for the job. And therefore, you get this blind spot about who can do what jobs. And you actually think you're the only people who can do it. So you're in that sense, you're not disadvantaging anyone else because they're all rubbish. Mm. You know, they couldn't do this because they didn't learn Latin aged eight and, you know, they don't know how to peel an orange properly. So, you know, that's that's How do the you mindset. peel an orange properly? I now feel incredibly it was, anxious. It was one of the first things I was taught about how when we were sitting in our dining table and we were all given an orange and we were given a lesson in how to peel an orange at table. Do you do it the way I do it where if you peel it one way first and then you take the other sides off, it looks like a penis? <laughs> that wasn't part of the lesson as I remember it. <laughs> well, what, I mean, what is it? How do you peel an orange? Well, the way we, and I'm worried now because, you know, maybe, maybe my school wasn't, didn't peel oranges properly. You see, as soon as you get into this, it's a minefield because mm -hmm. there were other more expensive schools and maybe this is my way, but I'm going oranges. to, I'm okay. going to risk it. Okay. I'm going to risk it. So you have your orange, you take your knife, which needs to be a sharp enough knife. You make one scour around the top, like you would for an egg, for example, okay. maybe a bit higher up. You uh, take that bit off first, then you make you do uh, scours down uh, the the peel into quarters, mm -hmm. and you take each quarter off, and then you you open it and peel the segments. When you eat the segments one by one, on your on your plate, it it's so funny. It, it doesn't matter how old I get or how worldly I get. I sometimes have these moments of colliding with how posh I'm not. I didn't even occur to me to use a knife to peel an orange. I've never had that thought in my entire life. And it feels like when you have only ever read a word and you say it out loud and someone corrects your pronunciation because they've heard it spoken before and you haven't, it's that feeling of going, ah, my head is bumping against the class ceiling. Yeah, I mean, the fact, the fact that we were sat down and sort of taught that early, but you see this going through. I mean, I, and I, I thought this very strongly when... Um, Rees Mogg went around his department and gave him grammar rules, essentially, about how you should, you know, punctuate your emails. 
Um, and he was very much playing a power game and saying, I know how to do it. You don't know how to do it. I'm better educated than you are. Um, therefore, I know better than you. If I, if I always get my apostrophes right, I know better than you in every single sphere, sphere of human existence. It's a bit the same with the orange. Mm. Now, if I peel the orange correctly, then if you want to talk to me about monetary policy, I'm going to know better than you. you know, and if, if you don't think so, I'll just point at the orange. You know, I'll point at my apostrophes. Um, so it's a very invidious sense of what's correct and what's incorrect in English society, extending into what's good and what's bad, what's good and what's evil. It is a form of morality, and it starts with apostrophes and oranges. When you've had that drilled into you, does it stay with you? Is there a bit of you which looks at a rogue apostrophe or a roguely peeled orange and goes... Yes, I cannot say that it 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 doesn't, um, and I think the the depth of the conditioning is is huge. And my youngest is now at college, um, in music sixth form college. Mm-hmm. And when he first went there, you know, I was thinking, I was I was scared for him. I was, you know, I was. I was Did your so kids go to private deep. school? May I ask? No, 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 um, and not boarding school. Definitely not. <laughs> um, so. That, that that kind of sense, I had the fear. And I was thinking, no, I've got to be bigger than this. And of course, then he goes to school and then everyone, you know, it all works out and everyone's friendly and he's got good friends. And he said, well, what was I scared of? But I was still scared and I have to admit to being scared, I think, because then I can see how deep the conditioning goes. Um, and it's there. Yes, it is there with the apostrophes and the oranges as well. I mean, just going back to the fragmentation of the family unit, what does that do to the parent-child relationship i mean for all of the flaws in the relationship between me and my mom it's intensely loving and it didn't matter what i what i got up to as a teenager and i got up to a lot i knew where home was i could come home and i could be absolutely off my tits high as a kite like pupils the size of dinner plates but i came home because that was a place of safety and my mom's love lived there um does being sent away from that early age mean that home doesn't have that same effect and and when you are doing the normal stuff of like teenage experimentation doing things you shouldn't is there that sort of natural um break on how far it can go yeah i mean i think that that there's a lot there again i mean one thing is you send your kids to these schools for safety but actually in terms of um adolescent experimentation they're a lot less safe because they've got to go outside the school. They've got to break out of the school. They've got to, you know, go under a bridge to to drink, you know, cans of lager. They've got no home to go to afterwards, and they've got to hide when they're, you know, they're sick and in a, in a bad state. Uh, Cameron famously caught smoking his spliffs on a, on an island in the middle of the Thames. Not the safest place to experiment with drugs, you would think. Um, so they're not safe. They're actually less safe. I mean, it's it's not logical uh, the way that this works. And then. If you don't feel you're, you're going to go home for these kind of experiences, which is where you know the love can be fostered, and you can see that your parents love you unconditionally, you know whatever state you might have got yourself into, um, then that's just one example of the many ways in which that bond isn't being created. Uh, and it's always tempting to go back to the, the the psychology of what's now called boarding school syndrome. It's a there's a, a group of uh, psychologist Joyce Shaviran has written about this very eloquently um, and, th- and there's, a, there's a, the sort of basic problem with love with the parents which is very hard to overcome which is when kids are sent to boarding school the parents say well you know I love you and then the kids go but I'm crying here in the boarding school and so what does love mean well it means that people who love you abandon you you know and therefore the re- for the rest of your life you can be thinking well love means I'm going to be abandoned so then that can spread into you know all areas of your life, as you can see, but it's certainly going to affect your relationship with your parents. How can you trust you know what they say? They say they want the best for me, and yet I'm here in a corner crying. So how is that the best for me? And there's that that doubt, that suspicion will be there in the relationship. And you know, perhaps it can be resolved. Certainly I think it's very difficult to do so. I mean, like we're talking about this and it's almost abstract and it's like it didn't happen to you, but in the book you talk about having to um, explore this with your mother. I mean, what was that like for her? I've written a, a previous book about, about the death of my brother where I interviewed my mother and it was a totally revelatory experience. Um, we had to kind of set it up, or I set it up as a slightly kind of fake situation where I'm interviewing my mum, like you're interviewing me mm. now. 
But she really opened up and we really enjoyed it and we became much closer. So I did the same thing for this book. Uh, and it was very moving because um, clearly in a, in a couple, um, so her and my dad, they didn't agree on everything, but they had to pretend it was a united front, obviously. So a lot of her own feelings came out, which she hadn't expressed before. And she she's not uh, from a private school background. And she certainly didn't want it to happen. But then she's living in a patriarchal society in the 60s when these decisions are being made in the late 60s, early 70s, and really has no say in the matter. And so it brought out a lot of you know, other inequalities within society, just in terms of uh, the fact that she could sit there 45 years later and say, I never wanted this to happen in the first place. And have been just pretending it was all fine ever since. I mean, you write in the book that women get a pretty raw deal when it comes to their relationships with boarding school educated men, whether that's romantic partners or mothers. Could you maybe explain a bit more about that? Well, there's this, I think there is this, like, this close bond with the mother you know, in, at that age, seven, eight years old, and then the mother has enacted a, a moment of betrayal. Um, no, I love you. I'll see you in four weeks. And it just doesn't really compute in terms of love and therefore later on in relationships, but especially with women, and I'll explain why that mm. is in a, in, in a second, there is this sense, well, if someone's just said they love me, now I've got to be careful. <laughs> this is where it's going to go bad now. And therefore, it's much easier to to abandon that relationship before you get abandoned. And therefore, you get these commitment issues, which are well known, and again, have been studied at UCL, private school educated boys, especially in boarding schools, statistically more likely to get divorced more likely to be, be separated from long-term relationships once you get into to middle age. Um, but the other reason why, why the, the, there's uh, you know, a, a, an obstacle with relationships with women is that within those boys' boarding schools at this time, and again, this would have changed a little, but not hugely, is that all the voices of authority were men. Mm. So if you need anything important done, you ask a man. There's no woman there who's, who's having any input in anything that is important. So the only women women we were seeing on a regular basis were the matrons who are in the boarding houses who make you cocoa before you go to bed and might offer a, a shoulder to cry, but the boys don't want to go and cry anywhere, so don't really take up that offer. Possibly the, the housemaster's wife who might be, you know, excellent at her job and offer that role. But again, it's sort of very, there's one person and you have to be careful with that relationship as well. So there, there's just no, if you've, got a, if you've got a problem or you want a bit of wisdom or some advice, there are no women to, to ask. And of course, perhaps if you want to extend that even further, the other women you'll see within the boarding school environment will be in, in the, in the dining hall and in serving in secondary capacities. So you get a very false view of the relationship between the genders generally. What was then that like for you? Because obviously you go to university, you went to the world of work, you start encountering the other half of the species. What was it like doing that, having been conditioned in that way? Well, I think you make a lot of mistakes. Um, is the first thing that happens. You make a lot of mistakes. Um, and then I think it, it can, go, it can go, go a number of ways. Now, one way it can go is that, you know, a boy from this background meets a girl from this background. He's gone to girls' boarding schools, and, the, and there, there are plenty of those who, who you know, who, who are churning out this the equivalent to the boys in the boarding schools from Rodin or Cheltenham Ladies College or whatever. And then you're safe in your tribe, and it's kind of phew. Let's repress everything together. Um, so that's <laughs> one way to do it. But then you see a lot of, I think, uh, a lot of um, people who've been through boarding schools, men and women, who go, "Well, I really want to break this cycle somehow." And it seems to me this is entirely kind of anecdotal to my own experience, mm -hmm. but statistically it does seem that a lot of people I know have been through boarding schools will try and make relationships with people from with with people from different countries, um, especially um, because then you think, well, I can break the cycle. I don't. I I can open up to someone who who doesn't have all the same kind of class hangups I do. Um, and I think it's quite, I find that quite, uh, it's something that I observe again and again, which, but I don't have any studies on Well, that. look, I can tell you what that was like from the other side of it, because I went out with this guy who went to one of your big four. And I felt like a fish who'd been lured in with this charm. And I thought that that might be warmth. And then suddenly I found myself in like a deep chest freezer because there were all of these things which were really weird, like um, 
I'd go to his house with like um, ingredients to make dinner for both of us. And he'd go, no, 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 you cook for you and I'll cook for me. And we'll eat at the same time. But I was like, that's so astonishingly unintimate and cold. And food is a part of how I show love because that's how my mother showed me love. It's an act of generosity and bonding. And there was so many other things like that. And again, it felt like you could only get so close and then a pane of glass existed, which he was pretending wasn't there, but I was clanging my head into in every interaction. So I don't know. I don't know if if, if the escape from boarding school syndrome is um, me a girl who's an outsider because as the outsider, well, it that would be that would nuts. be one thing. That would be what is something that that it would make sense to try out if you were actually trying to escape yourself. Really, mm. you're saying I want to. I don't want to see myself replicated, and and and. But it's difficult because then you're going to become aware of you know the fact that you're what do you call it a deep chest freezer, <laughs> you know, which is nobody wants to be that, and that's the problem is that the more self aware. Um, these boys come as men, they will think, I don't want to be this. And certainly since I've written the book, I've got a lot of messages from men in their 60s, 70s going, God, I've been trying to get out of this for years. I'm doing my best. And they, you know, and, and my poor old partner, they say, you know, after 30 years, 40 years and, and becoming aware of these problems. Um, but you see that a lot of it is about control. And again, when you're, you, you're in a communal space from a very early age, issues of control become very important. You know, what you can control what you can't control is likely to hurt you. So therefore you want to control as much as possible. Um, and you'll see that coming out again and again in, with, with, with people with this education. Because that's the essence of intimacy, isn't it? It's about what you can't control. It's this whole other person who's suddenly part of your inner world. And that's the terrifying thing about falling in love. No, and it's it's about sharing. It's about trust. Um, and not being able to control another person person means essentially not make sure they don't attack you and hit you in this this sort of very what can be quite a feral situation when you get into intimate relationships it's about well how can i trust this person how can i trust them not to to somehow hurt me in the way that i've been 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 hurt in the past and trust becomes very but the difficult but one of the reasons for that is not trusting yourself i mean these if you've been through this system you're you learn how to behave you learn how to do to, to peel your orange, and then that's the way to do it. But there's something in you which says, oh, I don't have to do that. You know, I don't have to be like this, but I don't trust myself I'm not like this because I've been educated to believe that this is how I make myself a good person because there's a lot of moral language in private schools. It's all you know, community and values and duty and dignity. And you know, these things come up the whole time. So you think this is how I am a good person is by hiding myself. And therefore, in intimate situations, that becomes the same thing. I need to stay hidden. And it's not a good recipe for close relationships. So how did you do it? How did you escape? How did you start listening to the voice that went, I don't have to peel my orange in this insane way anymore? Well, I think it helps not to be fully in it at the beginning. So you're, there will be scholarship kids who can get out of it quite easily. There'll be people from backgrounds which don't correspond to the traditional background. Um, my family background is very much of a kind of nouveau riche type background. So my dad made money as a builder in Swindon. He'd been to a very minor public school, but it was it was connected to the war and the fact that his brother had been, been um, what did they call it when they sent them away during the war? Um, evacuated? Yes, that's it, evacuated to this school. And then he ended up going there as well because there was a little bit of money by then. But then by the time he got to school, his own kids, they'd made a lot of money because Swindon was famously the fastest growing town in Europe at one stage. And that's great for builders. Um, so he had oh, all this they got money. Swindon. Yeah, I know. I bet that hasn't happened on this program before. <laughs> no, no, one's, no um, one's ever. I think this is actually the first mention of Swindon on this program. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad to, to be the first. So there, that money is suddenly there. And he looks around. He goes, well, what, what do I want to buy with my money? And he will one of the first things he thinks, I want to buy my kids out of here. You know, mm. He's gone to work at 17 with his dad in the family company. And he goes, I can I can get my kids out of here. So having bigged up Swindon, we're now going a bit the other way because my dad's feeling was, mm. you know, we need to escape this. So therefore, he decided to pay for this as high up the, well, he tried to get as high up the, you know, the, the kind of school rankings as possible and ended up in an all boys boarding school in Radley College in, in, in Oxford. Um, where did I start with that? 
We're going with how did you make your Oh, yeah, escape? how did you get out of it? Okay, yeah. so if you're not fully in it at the beginning, so therefore I arrived at the school, um, and there, were, there was, a, there were kind of, there was a, a class within the school which would be disparaged by the traditional public school sort of families, by, by, by the elders of the tribe, if mm-hmm. you like, as the nouveaux. So you're just nouveau because you're, you're, Dad's got a shoe shop, or you know, your mum's in marketing, or whatever it is. Mm. So there were there were there's there social mobility at the time, which again I think is one of the ways in which it's got worse. Mm. Is this, that social mobility doesn't exist in the same way because you know people who are recently rich, in a sort of modest way compared to an oligarch, could send their kids to to private schools. Whereas now you really need to be top of the tree. You need to be kind of hedge funds, corporate lawyers, and someone who's got a very successful couple of shoe shops wouldn't be able to do it, which you now, which you could do at the time. So you're already in this group, which is sort of made to feel slightly outside. You've got to earn your your way in. So you can either, you know, go for it and you buy your brogues and um, your winkle pickers for weekends. Uh, you know, there was a whole code. I, I would know, I, even now, I haven't said the word winkle picker for, <laughs> for a long time, but I can see the dress that you're supposed to, you know, what you're supposed to wear on a, on a Sunday and the, the way that the school, you know, was slightly modified at the time to the show. Jeans and a button up. Well, there was actually school rules about what you could wear and you had to wear a, a it, was, it didn't say sensible shirt, but it said something like a clean, neat shirt of, of and I think it had to be a solid pattern. You, you couldn't be, you know, you couldn't have a Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> Um, but that was actually in the school rules, but it was clear what you needed to do to, to belong. And there would be parties you went to these kind of parties where there are pictures of Prince Harry going to them, you know, 30 years later, these balls he goes to when he's 16 and he's in a bit of a state, mm. um, which you may have seen, you know, those parties have existed and, and yeah, balls in London that you're supposed to go to. So I wasn't doing any of that basically. Um, and I was still going home to, to Swindon, which as far as I know, nobody else in the school was going back home to Swindon. Um, and I used to love going to, to, to my friends' houses until, you know, I got to the point where if they didn't have a tennis court, I just wondered, what was the point? I might as well go home. <laughs> um, and I got into that for a bit, but then having not fully immersed myself in it, and I was only there for four years, not five, because I, I got out early for good behavior <laughs> and being good in class. Um, it did mean that I was kind of ready to look for something new straight away. Uh, and, and then I think there's a lot of luck involved. If you go and I went and did a job in, as uh, I was washing the pots in a hotel in Iona in the inner Hebrides, where it was just a mix of you know, outsiders from all over the British Isles. You know, it was, we had people, there people from Ireland, people from, um, you know, all over the place who washed up here. Um, a real mix of people. And I think that was the first thing which opened my eyes. And I, I just thought, I want to be like these people. I mm. want to be like those people. And then I, that was really what I put into action from that point. Was therapy a part of the process or was the way in which you made sense of all of this through writing? Therapy was part of the process, but a lot later. Um, that's only sort of really cut in in my, you know, kind of my mid forties. And that was to do with personal relationships. Just mm. thinking, you know, I just keep getting this wrong. Um, and in fact, partners would say, well, maybe you could go and see therapy, you know, do a bit of therapy. But I resisted it because again, part of being, a product of the best education money can buy is of course we don't need therapy because we're kind of perfect <laughs> and we're, we're not like other people I mean, what could be wrong with us um and that did help once I, I got into it but i think the writing was um was 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 an important thing to do because one of the things that you know it's the worst thing to do in these schools is to sneak you know it's, you, to, to tell on your friends Brassing. yeah you just, and, and we you used to be called sneaking you know, you don't sneak on people for doing things wrong. But often the sneaking would be, be, be sneaking on an injustice, you know, an older boy persecuting some younger boy or, or physically abusing someone else. So, you know, it, wouldn't, it wasn't sneaking. It was just trying to, 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 to right wrongs. But you'll learn very early not to do that. And then if you write a book about this, you know, that is 250 pages of sneak. <laughs> and it feels very liberating to have done that, to, to have said at last, no, I'm going to tell everybody what happened here. Because if you, if you get into this habit of not sneaking, um, this conditioned habit of, of thinking this is a terrible thing to do, then you are involved in that omerta of not spreading the truth about these places. And that's not just what happened to us in the 70s and 80s. It's about the social injustice, which continues now. Um, and it's about the fact that, as we said at the beginning, all these jobs are seem to be reserved for people from these schools. And it's about a, a fundamental inequality in, in British society. I was, I was thinking about this with the whole 
David Cameron, Piers Gaveston Society, penis in the mouth of a dead pig thing. Because to me, that seemed like such a ritualized form of humiliation, which also instills a sense of shame, which means you can never escape. It's like, well, we've all done these terrible things. We've all been witness to each other doing these terrible things and it keeps you on the inside. It's like having to participate in like a gang initiation where you like kick a passerby to death or something. Like you all have to be in this thing, like doing something terrible. Like what role does shame play in creating the social glue of this elite class as it ages out of school and goes through university politics the judiciary and so on and so forth oh i think that's that's a very good question when you go into the bullingdon club and and that next stage of it clearly there's almost kind of a masochism there it's saying like this has been bad so far but we're just going to make it a lot worse so everyone involved in this is really you know we are attached to by shame I think there's shame right from the beginning. There's, you know, there's the shame of not being loved, essentially. Um, you know, living without loved ones around you. It's a vague type of shame. It's not the, quite the same shame as as the pig. Or, I call it or, doing a reverse haram. <laughs> um, tell me what that means. Because instead of the pig going in your mouth, you're going in the pig's mouth. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, has that been, is that a, there was a picture, I mean, I don't know whether that's actually been well, established as truth. Has it, it was alleged in the um, Isabel Oakshot co-authored book with Lord Ashcroft, I think. And it was one of those things where when it came out, it didn't matter if it was true or not, because if you were an outsider, it finally confirmed for you what wrongings all these people actually were. And it sounds kind of plausible. Oh, um, I don't. When, when, I mean, I was not defending David Cameron in this instance. And it the inalienable sound right to plausible to me, but at the same at the same time, um, I was just never. I, I thought you might know more about it than I. I wasn't there. Did, being in that, being in the world of journalists and scoops and uh, uh, so on. Um, but I'm not going to get that from you now, am I? Well, I mean, it, uh, we talked about playing libel bingo before we went live. Um, all all that can be said about it is what's publicly known which is there are bizarre hazing rituals for Piers Gaveston Society and the Bullingdon Club these elite dining clubs of Oxford uh, one Bullingdon Club initiation included burning a £50 note in front of a homeless person um, and from my own um, you know tiny position in the rumour mill and talking to people who went to Oxford and but in the orbit of these places, there was this horrible cruelty of how everybody treated each other. And it's something when um, I went out with the um, boarding school alumnus, I noticed in a very small way, which is you'd be there watching him and all his friends interact with each other. And they were horrible to one another. And me and my friends like take the piss out of each other a bit, but that's a little bit more like, oh, you ate five ice creams in one day, crazy motherfucker. But not like this, where it was like, nobody loves you. Uh, like it was yeah i think the shame is that's really it's really you know it's it's a good thing to bring up and it would be really worth sort of following up on that um it, there is there is a sense of shame and of course you have the the shame and then the repression of the shame so then that's where the banter comes in because you need to show that you're tough you don't care about shame you know um and then you have the kind of hiding in plain sight thing where you admit to your shame you know whether the sort of that's more the that, that that's more the smashing up restaurants and the pigs really is that they I think when they talk about the smashing up restaurants and the bringing the club they want to say well, actually we're quite proud of you know we, we want to pretend we're proud of this we want to show that we don't you know we can't be touched because that's public you know those, those are public acts of well, vandalism essentially and they say well we can get away with this um, it's so slightly different from the from the pig thing but I do think yeah the tri the tribal unity strays stays strong because of various different elements and shame would be one of them. I mean, just to talk, talk about the politics of the book a bit more, um, David Cameron and Boris Johnson loom really large within the text of this book. And is it fair to say that your thesis is that boarding schools made them really psychologically damaged individuals and then they projected that damage 
and to the country that they governed by wreaking absolute havoc, behaving recklessly, unempathetically, um, and without care or respect for those who were below them, so to speak. That is my thesis, basically <laughs> summed up. Yeah, um, but it's not just them; it's other people in positions of power as well who again, like Cameron and Johnson, would not admit that they're damaged. They don't know what damage they're passing on. But one way to think about it is it's a it's a psychological equivalent of the trickle-down theory in economics. You know, conservatives love this idea that if the people at the top are really rich, then that will trickle, the money will trickle down to the people at the bottom. Well, the people at the top are really damaged. And that damage trickles down. Because if you want to get on in this country, you need to be know how to handle these kind of people. And it's hard to handle them if you want to get on in the same areas without taking on some of their traits, because otherwise they won't promote you unless you don't. If you, if you have to show that you look a bit like them to get promoted, otherwise they'll just say you're unsuitable. So, what are the traits? Well, well I think this we talked about dissociation. We've talked about this ability to be detached. I mean, even the way we're talking now, I think you know charm, which is a way of putting up a front, having a persona, um, showing that you're aware that there is a game being played. So that's irony. You have to somehow have an mm. ironical sensibility. Um, and I could probably add a few others, but that's enough to be going on with. And if you're missing some of those, you're just going to be deemed unsuitable. And what unsuitable means not like us. And that's at the top of our society. So Cameron and Johnson do loom large, but you could have, you know, you just, they happen to be the same age as me. Um, and therefore I could say directly, I know they had these kind of experiences. What are the you things that you noticed about them, which could perhaps only have been recognized by somebody who also grew up in that environment? Can I just, I, can I, just, I just want to finish the yeah. bit before. Is why, why then have, haven't we had such hopeless leaders before? I mean, we haven't always had fantastic leaders. But one of the reasons why this hadn't shown itself before is that you have people like Macmillan, Old Etonian, becomes prime minister. But he his attitudes have been tempered by war. He's had experience of two wars, the First World War and the Second World War. And in the First World War, he meets a diverse cross-section of British society. Um, and then, of course, he's he's seen this horror. But he's had it's, it's, history has made him collide with other parts of the country in a way which is, was not true for Cameron and Johnson. Um, and then historically, and this is, this is, this point is made explicitly in Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism. And she started, I've, I read that book because so I thought, well, it's interesting. I can go from total institutions to totalitarianism. Maybe there's something to say. And she starts talking about English boarding school boys absolutely explicitly uh, that in the context of England, the damage that they have, we, the countries escaped that because they've gone off to the colonies and they've just express their full damaged selves in the way that they have um, run the colonies where they've, again, been entitled to, to lead. And you see that in all the problems which then ensue. And it's, it's very persuasive. Um, and therefore, again, you don't see that necessarily here in this country in domestic politics because a different type of person stays behind. So there are reasons why Cameron and Johnson bring this damage to the forefront of society in a way which previously it might have been a little bit um, in the background. See, I think that's the bit of the book which I didn't quite agree with in the sense that I buy that they're psychologically damaged. I buy that that plays out in their style of governance. But when it comes to somebody like Howard Macmillan, for me, a really key part of the story is the strength of working class institutions in this country, like the trade union movement, the fact that you've just established a cradle to grave welfare state, you've got the existence of the Soviet Union. So going back to this idea of enough rats can take down a giant, you're in this period of working class self-organization, those political interests being uh, having real force and a genuine fear of revolution, of socialism. Yeah, I mean, I like that. It's, 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 it's a bit more nuanced, but it might be that he had a pragmatism. Um, and Heath had a pragmatic, Heath's like different because he's sort of grammar school. It was the first well, part of this wave of non-public school leaders mm. where it looked like it was all over the public school dominance and then came back in again with, with Cameron. But if you say, so go, let's go back to Macmillan then, you could say, well, he has this pragmatism. At least he realizes that there is something to be frightened of. Mm. So, but, so he doesn't treat th these mass, you know, the unionized movements, for example, um, or the beginning of the National Health Service, which could benefit everybody. He doesn't treat these as things which just can be dismissed with contempt, which is what we see now, because the, the kind of, they know there's not enough experience, life experience for, for, for some of these politicians to even be pragmatic. And I think you see that with Rees Mogg is that he's so limited. He doesn't even have a basic national pragmatism about him. I mean, that's a kind of interesting 
way to look at what's going on now, which is the total refusal of the government to negotiate with trade unions on pay, their impulse is to go, oh, we're just going to introduce new laws to make it really hard to strike. And so the game of negotiation, the pragmatism that's involved um, from the government in terms of taking part in pay negotiations is out the window. It's like, we don't even have to um, acknowledge the legitimacy of organised labour in any way. So we're yeah, so far a, above. And no sense, I think, which perhaps you could argue if you if you had all the, the, the you know, if I had all the facts at my disposal, if I was a historian of, of the, the sort of post-war period, I think you could argue that that some of those public school leaders realised that the fear needed to be real. Actually, this could go really bad and we need to just back off a bit here. Whereas now I don't think that fear is real. I think the idea is, no, we, we cannot really be challenged. Look what's happened in the post-war period. We've ended up back where we belong, right at the chop. We've gone from, we've had these two Etonian prime ministers, we've now got a Winchester prime minister. This, this is the way it's always going to be. And therefore, if we deny people rights, well, what's it going to change, really? I mean, I was going to ask, how do you think Rishi Sunak fits into this picture? Because, of course, in some ways, it's this utterly establishment upbringing of, you know, Winchester and then Oxford and then the city and then number 10. Um, but he's also a South Asian man within that space. And you talked about skin colour being something which does mark you as an outsider when you're in the boarding school environment. So how do you see this fitting together in his character? Well, I think there's another number of groups to which he could choose to belong um, in the way that he acts politically, the two dominant ones seem to be to the establishment private school English tribe. And then to this kind of tech, American tech mm. sort of tribe as well. And I would say that's where his loyalties are, are, are kind of strained in, in, in him, not to do with you know what a, what a lot of people would think that he'd be incredibly loyal to to you know to, to his family background, for example. There doesn't seem to be much evidence of that in the way that he he actually, you know, um, devises policy. So I think that it's such a strong, remember 24 hours a day, day after day, boarding school, he's there in a boarding school, Winchester, boys boarding school. They are re-educating him all the time into this new way of seeing the world. And in the end, if it favours the structures which have always held power in this country, then he's perfectly acceptable at the top of the Conservative Party. I just sort of wonder what his sense of self is like. Um, I wish I could exist as like a fly on the wall, like inside his skull, because to have been a South Asian kid aged 11 and being packed off to Winchester, what you must have had to adjust to, I don't even know what kinds of behaviours it would have been. You know, there were toilet locks like on all of the doors in my school, right? I wouldn't have to worry about someone barging in, like... I don't know what the daily fear of humiliation would have been like as a person of colour in that space. But I think that you, so you get into the classic um, area of hidden self. You know, what self, what different selves has he had to hide to get on in that environment? Um, and then he's in, will be into the next stage, which is denial. Anyone who thinks they haven't hidden yourself in a boarding school environment well you know you're then in denial about hiding yourself because you can't be yourself in that environment because it's just too dangerous um uh you risk humiliation your humiliation is linked to shame as, as as we were talking about before um and it's it's unthinkable that you would go through that day after day you're on a surveillance the whole time you're always everything there's no privacy there um uh, you're being told where to be at certain times and there's always a place where you need to be at a certain time. All this is going to make you hide yourself, which is feeling something different, wanting to do something different. And inevitably, people who go through that become very good at it. And you're saying you just can't see how Rishi squares all these different shapes in his life. But that's part of the training. How did you look at Brexit and how that was unfolding like through the lens of sad little men. Did you see that as another act of public vandalism? Well, I th think it appealed to, to, to a kind of this sentimental nationalism, which, which is very strong in privately educated English kids and also in certain sectors of the working class. And I call it sentimental nationalism because it's, it's, around, it's based around exceptionalism. 
It's based around, we won the Second World War and therefore flags and therefore poppies and therefore we are different from everyone else. We can do better. And the two edges joined there between those who are incredibly wealthy and those who are incredibly poor. And that was the kind of alliance which was formed. But the tropes that I saw then being exploited by you know, by Johnson, by Gove, um, for, for for their own ends. Well, it's almost like they were talking to the school like private school teachers. You know that we are a fantastic nation. We can do what we want. Um, why? Well, we just are better, and and you see see that playing out. Um, but also, I think Brexit appeals to small boys who are sent away. For school, one thing you learn early on, you know, this idea that we're this island that has never been invaded, which is what you learn at private school. You know, since 1066, nobody has invaded our island. And you're this small island self, which is right in this school. And say, well, I'm never going to be invaded either. I can exist alone. That sense that, you know, alone, you can, you can flourish. Um, and if you're scared of relationships anyway, you don't really want to put in the effort to uh, work on relationships, even if they're diplomatic. You know, much easier not to have any relationships at all. So I see a lot of kind of private school neuroses coming out in Brexit. And now we see how hard that the Brexiteers cling on to these notions of themselves alone, isolated, don't need relationships, and there's nothing wrong with us. <laughs> there's something wrong with everybody else. I mean, it's everything we've been talking about, really. It was maybe interesting to me that Brexit seemed to feature, feature a little bit more in this book than austerity did. Whereas for me, when I think about public school recklessness, I think about fitness to work assessments. I think about the cuts to benefits. I think about the bedroom tax. I think about the cuts to uh, children's social services in particular because of the area where my mum worked, is perhaps that element of it still a little tiny blind spot because you could look at the Brexit referendum as two sets of elites competing. So uh, elite which is oriented towards Europe versus an elite which is Eurosceptic and isolationist, whereas austerity is rooted in the experiences and the subjectivity and the humanity of people who have never set foot in any of those spaces. Yeah, I think that's that's fair. I mean, I could have written about austerity as well, but you know, you've got to draw the line somewhere. Well, the interesting point, one of the interesting points about austerity in terms of how it came about, is that you have the election, um, 2010. And it's clear that there's a progressive majority not to have austerity with the Lib Dem votes and the and the Labour votes. There are more of those than there are Conservative votes. But public school boy Nick Clay and public school boy David Cameron look at each other. They recognise each other. So we, we can work together. You know, you be deputy and I'll be the prime minister. And they make that happen, which is clearly not what the country has voted for. Um and that's you, there, there, there's something to be to be. There's more to be kind of written about that. But I think the whole of austerity does very much correspond to what we were talking about: having this lack of empathy and not really being understand the consequences of decisions that are being made. Um, and you see that, you know, in the in the in private lives in terms of lockdown parties, eye tests. You know, the consequences aren't for us. Undisclosed number of children. Yep. Consequences aren't something that come for us. Uh, you know, early on in, in, in when Cameron's at school, he gets, he's smoking these drugs on this, in the Thames, he just gets a rap on the knuckles and told to sort himself out. He doesn't get any police record or there's no police involved. Um, there are no consequences. And, uh, I can't see how that can't spread into the way that you think you're going to run the country, that these the consequences just become unimaginable. Um, and then you can end up with 13 years of austerity. One of the things which I found fascinating about the book was this vein of fascism that was running through it. So you have these kids who, for the general, elect uh, general election hustings, are role-playing as members of the National Front or the British Union of Fascists, did that represent a genuine and sincere ideological affiliation with fascism, or was it just live action role playing? Well, you can you can say that, but they're doing it in an environment where it's it was tolerated, and where um, these boys who are, if you like, role playing their membership of the British Union of Fascists, who are standing up on this platform above a courtyard of, of cheering boys, all of them white. Um, 
uh, and they're saying, you know, I have a dream of a white England. Uh, you can call that role playing if you like, but I don't think it's uh, very helpful or useful to their sense of, you know, what is actually applicable in in the country as a whole. Um, and and I. F- I found my memory of it. I needed to check my memory of it, but it's reported in the school magazine. So it's kind of, there's no shame around that. It's so actually it's there in the school like nothing's magazine. nothing's wrong with it. Yeah, I think, you know, if because of trying to trying to see the school side of it, they probably said, well, it's free speech. You know, we we're, we were allowing our kids free speech, but there's still, you know, there's the cheering, there's the turning up to meetings in SS uniforms, then the repeating of those speeches. So it's not just once, and then have a second forum in which they can repeat the same speeches um, saying, I dream of a white England. You really think, well, you know, where where does this end? Where does the role playing end? And where does again real life consequences start? And so you have Farage. He's in his mm-hmm. private school, Dulwich College. His teachers actually call him a fascist, and famously, the headmaster says, "Yes, he may be a fascist, but that doesn't mean he can't be a good prefect." And they <laughs> they promote him, and his that has had real world consequences. Um, uh, and so I think, yeah, you, you can dismiss it as role playing, but then it, that's another habit of these schools is that, you know, if it's a bit inconvenient for us, we'll find some excuse. Because remember, rhetoric is really important to the education, argument, debate. One of the things you learn is to win an argument, even if you're wrong. It's the most useless skill that anyone can have, but it's one that's widely used. Here's some journalistic gossip for you. Um, I was told this by a producer um, on a show and in the green room, Nigel Farage was offered a real ale because that's always what he's drinking when he's doing these like photo calls and pubs. So, okay, well, can we get you a real ale? And he went, no, of course not. Like a white wine. Or well, red wine, actually. It was a red wine, like a nice Pinot. Because he's been LARPing, right? It's, a, it's this um, marrow deep insincerity. And it's that divided self which you were writing about, which is, no, this is just for the stupid proles i want yeah so that's so you could say yeah so he's still role playing that he's role playing with with consequences and all survivors of a total institution will be role playing um to a certain extent and and then there's a question about how healthy is that to go through every day to get out of your bed every morning and go well what role am i playing today and you you yeah, and look at Johnson. You know, what role is he going to play? Depends. Am I going to be cuddly bear today? Am I going to be funny man, TV man? Am I going to be uh, international statesman? Am I going to be victimized uh, defendant in the latest case against me? You know, what role does he play today? It doesn't help our public life in any meaningful way. Just to sort of like draw this to a little bit of a close, have you noticed the difference that comprehensive education made to your children as opposed to private education? And contrasting it against your own experience, I think my kids are much more tolerant than I am. Um, also, they're also much calmer. I mean, there are a lot of in, intolerances which go with a, um, a private school education, which at the time are thought to be kind of virtues. All this stuff about you know, everyone needs to turn up on time, all the equipment needs to be kind of ready. Um, this kind of intolerance of punctuality. You know, some, well, you, of course you can get there on time because you've nothing else to do. You're in the school 24 hours a day. <laughs> you know, they've done a timetable, so you've got plenty of time to get from where you are to where you need to be next. Then you go into real life and people don't turn up on time. Um, and you think, well, I'm intolerant of that. And then it, the, the, you get to a point where, no, you're just intolerant. <laughs> um, and there's sort of intolerance of things not being at their best all the time. And we go back to Rees-Mogg going around his department being intolerant of misuse of apostrophes. You know, there are lots of these sort of intolerances which are thought to be virtues and i see in my own kids they are much more tolerant and they're much more you know understanding that things you know things go wrong um when you're used to things going right because everything's timetabled everything is resourced properly things are supposed to go right and they do go right and that's why people pay to go to private schools as well because there's safety of things going right all the time um and it can breed an enormous intolerance things going right all the time for when you come out into the world and things don't go right all the time. So that's the main difference I see. This is the much more tolerant on a daily basis. Um, and I hope that they are much more attuned to themselves. Would you ban private schools? I, mean, I, don't, I don't think, I think if you take away the advantages they have in particular with charitable status, um, then you know I can't see how they can survive in the same way um, in the way they have done, the way they assumed they will. However, you can never think that you can getting rid of private schools is something which different governments, you know, over the, over the 
the years and since, you know, going back to 1861, actually Clarendon Commission, there was, there's this complaint about the state of the public schools then. The people who can argue best and the best position to defend them are former private school people with vested interests. And it's going to be very hard to kind of legally change the status of these schools, I think, because there'll be a lot of, a lot of, um, kickback against that. Do I think it should, should be banned? I, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'd be really difficult. Um, and, but I think the benefits would outweigh the problems because in the end, people who are making education policy have to have a vested interest. Um, and at the moment, the great sadness is, you know, I can see that the national health service is going the same way as the education system is that if you don't use it because you have private health insurance, why really do you care how long people are waiting? And it's the same with education. If you're, kids have got their grade eight violin by the age of 15 before going out, you know, with a professional cricket coach um, in a series of 25 nets they've got next to, you know, one of the nicest pieces of grass in England. Why do you care if there's only one pound 10 for sports provision you know, in, in, a, in a comprehensive school? And unless the people who are making policy have a vested interest in their own kids' education, just as in their own kids' health, I don't think that the comprehensive schools are going to get better and there's a clear correlation between underfunding of the comprehensive schools and the flourishing of private schools, because then that increases the fear. Parents' fear is greater because the comprehensive schools are under-resourced. They think, well, I must pay. I must get the money together somehow. So both in the Thatcher years and in these last 13 years of, um, of, of conservative governments, funding for schools goes down, the applications to private schools goes up. Now, they, they will say, well, that's, that's choice and that's a sign of success, but actually it's a sign of a national failure. The more applications there are to private schools, the more that shows that education policy is failing. You know, I've always thought it should happen if you can't ban them outright. You could introduce a 7% cap in any taxpayer-funded institution. So only 7% of people who are allowed at a university or the civil service or the judiciary um, or politics for that matter can come from private schools. Because when you no longer have the unfair advantage, what's the fucking point? Well, exactly. And the people who... who um, you know a lot about this, think that um, if you can break the link between public schools and Oxford and Cambridge, Oxford in particular, when it comes to politics, then suddenly parents will start thinking, well, what's the point? You know, what, if, if these advances aren't there um, and Oxford's, uh, Oxford and Cambridge, their percentage of private school entrance is coming down all the time. It's still high. It's about 30%, which clearly is a lot higher than 7%, but it is coming down from, you know, 50, 55% that it was in the, in, in the eighties. Um, that if you break that link, that again will be a useful way of moving forward. So actually Oxford and Cambridge have a very important role to play here. I mean, the, the trouble is with that is that if you're, if you can still go to private schools and then go to Stanford or, or, Heidelberg or something, mm. and they come back and have the same advantages. It's just, you just have to take a little bit of a, a, a detour. But I mean, there are ways in which this can be engineered through other institutions like the universities, for example. My mum gave me three reasons for why she didn't send me to private school. First was she was too poor. Second was ideologically she objected to it. And then the third was there's no guarantee you would have been smart. And if you came out stupid, I wouldn't have gotten my money back. And I just thought... You know what? She didn't go to a fancy school, but she was an intelligent lady. Yeah, I mean, these the, the arguments like that are, are great. It's like when people say to me, I had one review of my book which said, "Well, obviously, private education worked because you wrote a book." And then <laughs> the assumption is that if I didn't have private education, I couldn't have even been able to write. You know, <laughs> it's kind of nonsense. Uh, comments come out about these things, um, but teachers at, at private schools do get exactly that conversation. The parents will go for the parents' evening and their kid isn't doing very well. And they will just look at the teacher slightly dead-eyed way and say, but we're paying. You know, <laughs> why isn't my kid understanding Latin better? And, uh, you know, the teachers themselves, Some, you know, we haven't even talked about teachers. <laughs> How do you teach in these schools if you genuinely believe in education, equality, equal opportunities for all? What are you doing as a very able person who's got a degree and knows how to teach kids? What are you doing in these schools to start with? That's another discussion. Oh my God, that time. could be a whole other hour. But um, Richard Beard, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much.